today we are discussing the past time of chota haridas which is one of the more disturbing past times you could say in the entire cc so let's begin om gyana timirandasya gyananjani shalakaya chakshurun militam yena tasmay shri gurave namaha nama om vishnu padaya krishna prishtaya bhutale श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी इति नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देश तारिणे वांचा कल्पतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा सो दैट वी विल बी स्किपिंग फॉर नाउ बट लेट्स बिगिन विद दिस सो इन इन फैक्ट वी कुड से दैट दिस इज प्रॉबेबली in some way that is the most serious the scariest past time but i'll try to look at some broader lessons from it i try to understand it in context and then especially the theme today we'll be discussing is what do extreme examples in scripture teach i was also planning to discuss about guilt and pseudo guilt but that itself is a huge subject and we may not get to discuss it today because of time but let us see so in the broader context mahaprabhu has now traveled to south india once traveled to north india once he has come back and he settled in puri and now he has decided he is going to travel no more so he is not going to travel any more so what is he going to do he is going to now focus on going deeper and deeper within to his, to the practice of bhakti so in this particular past time in one sense chaitan charitamrita is a little vague in describing what happens and there are other biographies of lord chaitanya mahaprabhu where many of these don't even mention these past this past time and as i mentioned in the beginning there were 27 biographies written out of which nine are available right now and our acharyas have focused primarily on three of them chaitan charitamrita chaitanya bhagavat and chaitanya mangal there are a few others also But our acharya is not primarily focused on those, and a chota haridas past time is not prominent. Uh, there is not much description of this past time elsewhere. So therefore, what we have, what the sources that we have, are the particular past time that is described here, Shri Prabhupada's purports, and now both Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur and Bhakti Vinod Thakur have written commentaries on this. Hmm. and again none of them go much into the details of exactly what happened they focus more on describing or we could say explaining the rationale for mahaprabhu's actions and often even the explanation of their rationale is from their cultural context so bhakti vinod thakur is speaking to bhadra loka who Bhadraloka, as we know, are the elite Bengali people who were educated by the British and were employed by the British, and thought themselves, uh, you could say, superior to the general uneducated, superstitious people. And so, in one sense, he, Bhakti Nath Thakur's explanations are sometimes quite liberal, because these people were already suspicious. of this gaudiya vaishnavism it's a beggar's religion it's it's impractical it is there are a lot of misconceptions about gaudiya vaishnavism and why those misconceptions we have to discuss we'll discuss that later in the pradyumna mishra past time and bhakti sanas thakur he was in one sense primarily writing uh, he to his disciples now he had a lot of sanyasi disciples and he did focus on high standards of renunciation so his explanation is from that context now what do i mean by this context that 
every acharya when they write a commentary the the principles they teach are eternal but at the same time they are also addressing a particular audience when they are addressing a particular audience the explanation is directed toward that audience it's just like you know if somebody is giving a class to a particular audience say if our our guru maharaj or some other venerable spiritual teacher in our movement is giving a class say in america or in india or in russia um, or say if somebody is giving class in russia and right now there's a, a war breaking out in russia and ukraine so if they give a class at that time they will often cater the philosophy from that perspective okay they will have some something to speak from that perspective so what happens is Uh, to some extent bhakti sadan sir thakur's explanations he had a sanyasi disciples and he wanted high standards for sanyasi disciples so he his explanations are we could say a bit conservative on the strict side so bhakti sadan thakur's examples are ex- explanation of this past time is a bit liberal and bhakti sadan thakur's explanation bhakti sadan sir thakur's explanation is a bit conservative so now from our perspective in today's world say uh, we are not trying to say if we had to explain this past time to a new person uh, it will be extremely difficult you know what exactly happened over here this uh, that's why chaitanya charitamrita prabhupad called as a the post graduate study in theology so we are not trying to explain this to entirely new people which is a very very difficult past time to explain and nor are most of us in fact none of us i would say are sanyasis so we are trying to see what lessons we can draw from this past time for us so in that sense i will draw some points from bhakti not thakur and bhakti sanjay thakur both but because our context is different so i'll be focusing on what we can learn and we will look at not just what prabhupad's purports talk about but also i'll talk about a few incidents from prabhupad's life specifically to address how misunderstanding or misapplication of this of the past time can have disastrous results so with that background let's look quickly at the past time so mahaprabhu was living in puri and over a period of time many associates started coming and staying with him so we know that when he came from first from mayapur he brought some associates with him gadadhar pandit stayed with him and we if we visit jagannath puri we have the place where gadadhar pandit stayed still there and then his assistant govinda came there and he stayed mahaprabhu asked ramanand rai to come and stay there uh, himself he asked then we, we had haridas thakur coming and staying there and one of the associates who also came and stayed there was chota haridas so now it chota haridas chota means as you say small So this or as prabhu patan said that junior haridas so he was he we could say the word bada haridas is not used generally because is haridas thakur is a normal person he was actually older than mahaprabhu also so chota haridas was a good singer and he was also in the renounced order now there is no evidence actually that the that haridas thakur the senior haridas thakur had ever taken sanyas uh because he had been born in a mlecha family so uh, the official order of sanyas was difficult for him but everybody knew that he was an exalted person but chota haridas seems that he was formally in the sanyas order and at that time the normal system was that most people most people in the renounced orders they would do madhik madhukari madhukari means they would go out and seek arms seek arms from the uh, uh, from that uh, seek arms from generally from grahastha they are the people who have something now there was mahaprabhu was such a great sanyasi that he didn't have to go out and seek arms people would himself provide and in this case pratapudra was his patron sarvam bhattacharya was uh, the royal priest and royal advisor of pratap rudra who was the king 
So for him, they would provide everything. So then, uh, when Chota Harid, when they would go for having Madhukari, quite often, when the uh, when the those from the renounced order would go, it would happen that if they would go to the house of a person, at that time the grahastha male might be out working, and only the female would be there. So we know that this is the exact strategy that Ravan used. But in the case of Ravan, he had deliberately arranged that Ram and Lakshman would not be there, so that Sita would be alone, and he wanted to exploit her, abduct her first, and then exploit her. So when Chota Haridas went to the house, he was going as usual for for arms, and he went to the house of Shiki Mahiti. Now Shiki Mahiti is also an associate of Mahaprabhu, and when he went there, at that time something inappropriate happened. Now from the Chetan Chetamal's narrative, what it seems is that. There, the, the the extent of the inappropriateness is not clearly indicated. It it seemed that there was a inappropriate glancing or staring, but there could well have been more than that. Generally, the uh, the how should we put it that many of the Eastern cultures mm -hmm, that we will say broadly. See, if you look at the Puranic times in the Puranas. The even great characters, if they do something wrong, it is openly described. Say so Indra has many embarrassing instances. Even Yudhishthir, he is Dharmaraj, but when he gambles Draupadi away, he gets completely swept away by the urge for gambling, and that's openly described. But as the medieval times started coming in, India, the Indian culture started becoming more of a face-saving culture. Face saving culture means that in general, if some something bad happens or something something bad is done by someone, the details of the bad thing are not told publicly. There is, if somebody is a respectable person, if somebody is, uh, so if they have done something wrong, the general understanding was there is no need to broadcast it to everyone. Now, why did these changes happen? Generally, behavior of people responds to the kind of society that they are in. So, in general, in the medieval times, medieval times means roughly from the 11th, 12th century onwards, till the 18th, 19th century, you could say, from the 19th century onwards, modern times started. So, during the medieval times, with this face saving culture, it's not just the Chaitan Charita Amrit. But many other literature, whether they are the bhakti literature or they are general, even secular literature, um, the sometimes the controversial, scandalous parts are not described very clearly. So, just to give an illustration of this, what I mean that there is an incident similarly that there is one associate of Mahaprabhu, there is Damodar Pandit. Hmm. And there is this young boy who comes and uh, who who comes and uh, who 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 has great affection for Mahaprabhu, and Mahaprabhu also shows great affection to that boy, and has loving interactions with him. And then Damodar Pandit comes and says, "Mahaprabhu shouldn't spend too much time with this boy." So, um, and the Chaitanya Charita's mood overall is that. It's a bit presumptuous for Damodar Pandit to be instructing Mahaprabhu. He says, "What will people think if you behave if you behave like this?" Then we say, "Okay, this is just a small boy. In, there is interaction with him. What's the big deal about it? You know, showing affection to a boy. It's not that those medieval times, 16th century, is like uh, modern times in 20 in in, in today's world in America. You know, if there is some if there's a stranger." Show some affection to a boy. Tomorrow, that person may be accused of child abuse. So there is paranoia. Now, it was not like that over there at all. So what's wrong? Again, Chetan Charitamru doesn't make it very clear. It mentions that this boy's mother was a widow, and and Damodar Pandit says that people will talk about this. So then, Mahaprabhu tells Damodar Pandit that you please, you please go to. 
Mayapur and stay there. The thing is, Mahaprabhu critics Mahaprabhu in one sense punishes Damodar Pandit, but Mahaprabhu still takes his advice. or his uh, point he appreciates and he doesn't spend time with that boy so much afterwards so what's going on over here so we need to read other literature to understand the context so the kama sutra as we know is is a book which focuses on like dharma dharma artha kama moksha so we have dharma shastras we have artha shastras we have kama shastras also and then we have moksha shastra So the Upanishads are generally considered to be Moksha Shastra. The Vedas themselves are Dharma Shastras, and say now Artha Shastra, Kautilya's Artha Shastra is the most famous among his Artha Shastras. But there is there are like that Kama Shastras also, and Kama Sutra is one of the Kama Shastras. So what happens in the Kama Sutra is that it's described that one of the ways. So one of the ways in which if a person wants to have an inappropriate relationship with a woman is that that man shows a lot of affection to that woman's child especially the male child and that is seen as a sign as a sign of sexual signaling is indication okay then it's almost like uh, in today's world people may send some love letters or now sms or facebook so many ways people can go about doing that but as a now <clears throat> there so this in kama sutra is in kama shastras not just kama sutra kama shastras this is considered to be a form of sexual signaling and there is a in, in a more much more purer context there is a indication of this in the bhagavatam also when krishna comes to dwaraka at that time everybody is there to welcome him and uddhava and other members when they come maha krishna offers respects to the elders he hugs his equals and he offers blessings to his junior people but in the public his queens cannot come and hug him they cannot offer their expression to him, affection to him in that way so what do they do they all the queens send their sons and when krishna he ex he tosses their hair as the hair of his sons and he hugs them the queens feel loud that way now that's that's a cultured pure way with we affection could apply for somebody who is seeking some inappropriate relationship so there are these we could say there are this cultural cultural specifics that may not be known to others so broadly speaking that yes what the chaitanya charitamrita says that there's a inappropriate glance but it could be that a glance indicated a signaling of something more or it may not be but one thing is clear that there was nothing nothing physical that happened between the two of them between and shiki maiti is also said to be not not a not a young girl she is supposed to be a uh, she is to be a mature lady so but then after this particular thing happens so he collects his arms and now most of them would collect arms for themselves and and they might also bring if they got some good arms they might get it for as supplies for mahaprabhu also for his stock usually they would not need that but mahaprabhu took his prasad and he said i will not see chota haridas anymore and don't bring him under my, in my presence anymore chota haridas is stock what happened and then he also realizes oh okay i'm being punished for this and he's completely broken he was a he was a very good singer and he wanted to sing and please mahaprabhu all the time but unfortunately he is not able to do that and he's heartbroken devastated he is very remorseful so then the associates of mahaprabhu console him and they say you know wait wait mahaprabhu may be upset with you but wait things will be better they wait unfortunately mahaprabhu doesn't seem to be softening his attitude and then several of the senior vaishnavas some of them including one parmanand puri who is of the generation of the guru of mahaprabhu even they go and try to request mahaprabhu to forgive him and to accept him in his association but mahaprabhu says if you insist on this then you, you can have him in in your association but kindly excuse me i will go and stay in alalnath you know this we will see 
is a const is, is a repeated motif in the antelila that when mahaprabhu is very upset with something and he doesn't want to argue over there he doesn't want to confront too much he says okay i'll go and live in alalnath alalnath is a nearby place where there is a uh, temple of vishnu so they would is realize okay mahaprabhu is not going to budge on this so then they say that chota haridas don't worry let's wait for some time but chota chota haridas is heartbroken and then he, he enters into the ocean over there and he ends his life and when he ends his life and the devotees they say that he's disappeared and then they come they come to know what has actually happened they are they are heartbroken mahaprabhu is they are also shocked at that time mahaprabhu is, remains grave mahaprabhu remains grave and then after that when mahaprabhu is out on his walks mahaprabhu would every day several times go to jagannath temple for darshan and come back at that time they heard uh, ethereal ethereal means non physical voice singing the glories of krishna the mahamantra and the songs of krishna uh, for wherever mahaprabhu is going for mahaprabhu's pleasure and mahaprabhu smiles mahaprabhu at least he indicates his pleasure at that or at least he doesn't indicate his displeasure and the devotees understand that this is chota haridas and he is singing for mahaprabhu's pleasure now something that he, he because he ended his life he became a ghost but we'll see how valid that particular incident is now <clears throat> this is the broad past time so let's look at what exactly is going on over here from one perspective it may say it's it's okay if there was nothing physical that happened even if there was some inappropriate uh, in inappropriate expression in appropriate glance even an inappropriate intention should there be such a extreme punishment for this mm. there is one western commentator on chetan charita on chedor chetanya uh, he is translated chetan charita amrit says that he says that uh, that sri chaitanya's extraordinarily saintly character in his uh, his is ecstatic devotion to the lord is is wonderful but there is this one blot on his character that he was cruelly unforgiving and that's why one of his associates had to end his life and this person was actually a, otherwise is very very appreciative of mahaprabhu and he is a christian and he com- compares mahaprabhu's ecstasies with jesus ecstasies or jesus spiritual experiences so then bhakti sanat thakur and bhakti nath thakur have anticipated this kind of criticism and they try to respond to it also so in general the first point is that these are not the kind of past times that are meant to be spoken to new people they are uh, they are we could say there are esoteric past times of different kinds so we don't just as we don't speak about radha krishna's past times intimate rasala past times new people even this is not a past time we speak to new people because that is the kind of impression that comes up that that this is such a such an unforgiving attitude but was mahaprabhu really unforgiving and was that the that was that the point of this past time that if anybody commits wrong then they will never be forgiven well if that were the lesson then why have a past time like jagai and madai jagai and madai they had done far greater crimes they had uh, they had used force in their exploitation of people including the exploitation of women and they were delivered by mahaprabhu through nityan prabhu so would mahaprabhu do something like this for them why such difference so to think that this is simply an unforgiving nature or that's that's not a it's a terrible misunderstanding so let's begin with a discussion of the overall past time so i'll take two broad themes over here and in the first theme we'll discuss and then we'll stop and then we will again um uh, we'll again i have we'll have questions and then we'll again resume after that so first point is was his strictness excessive well it can seem like that so mahaprabhu he was setting a standard that was extraordinarily high and correspondingly he also set a punishment that was extraordinarily high now what do i mean by a standard that was extraordinarily high 
that we know that there are sannyasis in the other traditions also there is ramanucharya who is considered yati raj yati is sannyasi and raj is the king of sannyasis uh, madhacharya himself was also an enunciate but if you look at their lives they have not displayed this kind of strictness uh, yes they were also strict sannyasis but especially like this kind of strictness are not there now why is that because their folk uh, one reason of course many reasons we could say but one reason was the context and i'll explain what my what was the context so the standard that he was set was very high was that even when mahaprabhu's female disciples would come to meet him now mahaprabhu never gave initiation to him so generally in the chetan charitamrut when the word disciple is used it is used in a very broad sense that those who were inspired by him those who were following him our parampara is more of a shiksha shiksha parampara there is no evidence that mahaprabhu ever conducted a fire sacrifice a yagna to initiate anyone hmm? that doesn't mean it didn't happen there is just no textual evidence for that so but his female followers when they would come they would offer him respects from a distance and there were some occasions when there was a violation of this rule and somebody who was very dear to mahaprabhu that person would come and say this is my sister or this is my so and so and that was a in one sense a transgression of the usual etiquette but mahaprabhu told mahaprabhu didn't make a scene out of that and that krishna's career so says us that is how considerate mahaprabhu was so again now there is no evidence that ramanacharya had his it is not that he was freely mingling with women but whether that he kept his female disciples at a strict distance there is no evidence of that so mahaprabhu in general was setting a high standard of renunciation and then therefore if that is the standard of renunciation then if there is anything wrong with that anybody going going off that then there is the punishment also and the and punishment is also extraordinary high so in general when there are extreme examples in scripture so our response should not be extreme our response needs to be balanced so what do we mean by balanced response so one extreme could be we take them as absolute standards and we replicate them literally the other is that this can lead to disaster and i'll explain why we take them as absolute standards the other is uh we take them as absolutely oh these are just impractical this is not this is just a standard which mahaprabhu was teaching for that time and it's got nothing to um then then what will happen is if we do this then we will miss out on the lessons to be got so this screen stop sharing if we take them as impractical and give no further thought to them then we'll miss out on valuable lessons so there is something to learn for all of us over here but we'll miss out on that so what is the balanced approach so we strive to understand the principle conveyed through the example and see how that principle applies today in our situation so let's look at these three and this is going to be the crux of our class today now if we as i said if there's literal replication of that that will lead to disaster why is that so first of all you know if we are authorities we may not have that level of purity to inspire and purify others leave alone demand such standards of purity from others and if we are subordinates and if we beat ourselves down with guilt we may beat ourselves down with guilt and we destroy ourselves emotionally and sometimes physically and unfortunately there have been many incidents like this so vishnu jan maharaj we know was one of the most dynamic preachers in uh, in among prabhupada disciples and he was adventurous the kind of he was the person who's who attracted indrajit maharaj who is also known to be extremely adventurous in his outreach now so when mahaprabhu when when all of the sanyasis would every year be sanyasis and leaders uh, 
at that time most of the leaders of sannyasis or not all the temple presidents were many grahasthas many of them were grahasthas they all used to come annually to jagannath puri uh, uh, sorry to mayapur for the uh, gaur purnima festival so at that time in one morning walk this pastime chota haridas ki and this devotee started uh, disciples started asking prabhupad this is you know so if if some they said that chota haridas this is what mahaprabhu said and he when he committed he ended his life he committed suicide then this is mahaprabhu felt that that was a fit punishment for his actions so then a disciple asked that i am paraphrasing the conversation that so if 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 one of your followers one of your disciples falls down what should they do or a sanyasi disciple falls down mahaprabhu has given the example that a sanyasi should end their life and now vishnu janan maharaj heard it and he fell back aghast now again there are different narratives about what exactly happened you know what exactly was the extent of, of what inappropriate thing he had done or what made him feel what he should do but eventually what happened what ended up happening was that that uh, he felt that he had done something wrong and the only repentance for him was to end his life so he just disappeared next morning he did mangal aarti and he disappeared and nobody knew where he went and some people thought that oh you know you such a dynamic person where did he go of course that, that was a time when sometimes even leading devotees would suddenly depart has he fallen away or what has happened then later on and some of the devotees went to triveni and there some of the local people told that some time ago there was a sanyasi who was just who was a western bodied person just like you had come and he tied stones around his neck and he entered into the triveni and he ended his life now that's a disaster for our moment now when the after that when prabhupad heard what had happened actually in that same conversation what happened was prabhupad was so prabhupad would you want your disciples to end your life like that prabhupad said no oh, that is mahaprabhu i cannot demand the standard mahaprabhu had he says i need all of you i need all of you and uh, no matter what happens always continue to serve krishna so prabhupad was teaching what mahaprabhu had done but he didn't say that that is what we have to do and this actually illustrates in no small way in a tragic way what can happen if we take one statement of prabhupad out of context and and emphasize it for apply it to ourselves or even apply it to others nowadays this is a big problem with the internet available you can just google and what are what are the statements of prabhupad about this particular topic and we can find 20 statements of prabhupad and now in what context is said prabhupad statements it could be about women it could be about uh it could be about about a particular about blacks it could be about about people with black uh, about various things and we can take them out of context and we can actually end up creating a negative picture of prabhupad or taking negative action based on those statements so this is very unfortunate and prabhupad was himself deeply saddened by what had happened prabhupad was extremely grave and morose for some time so this is literal replication which can lead to disaster now now this literal replication can go even further there was one particular sanyasi who was very fanatical about the principle of uh, now this is as i said this is extreme but even other principles could be applied in extreme way so there was one particular sanyasi who used to emphasize this principle of no illicit sex and when his disciples would get married you know he would actually after their marriage after a few days when he would come to meet him and ask them you know did you chant the proper number of rounds before you had your physical union and you know, it was extremely embarrassing kind of thing for their disciples and quite often sometimes the uh, especially if somebody is young or somebody has strong cravings it may not always be possible so now generally the broad understanding in our movement is that you know that there is a standard 
but we all will gradually move towards the standard it is not anyone's business and certainly not the spiritual master's business to uh, to interrogate a disciple like that prabhupad never interrogated disciples like that and in fact during his initiation lectures there are there are Prabhup- what illicit sex means prabhupad gave different explanations but one of my devotee friend, one of the prabhupad disciples has done ex- exhaustive research and during initiation lectures when prabhupad would talk about illicit sex he would emphasize illicit sex as no sex outside marriage so in one sense the initiation promise is no sex outside marriage and yes there is a higher standard that is physical union only for procreation uh, that is something we aspire for but in this case the sanyasi had this habit of interrogating and he had a prominent brahmachari disciple who had been there with him and he had, had he heard his guru speak about this dozens and dozens and dozens of times uh, and then eventually he was still young and he was um, eventually he felt the need to get married and then uh, on the night of the marriage he he united with his uh, he had physical union with his wife and after that he felt so guilty that on the same night he ended up ending his life because of that alone apparently and when his bride she came to know you know this is this is the wedding night she says okay where is my husband and she went to the next room and she saw that husband had hung himself when he was dead and she went mad because of that and then eventually she had to be admitted to a, a mental asylum and unfortunately she never came back to bhakti she recovered and went back to her family whatever and then eventually what happened was this particular sanyasi himself you know he lost his mental balance and he started he went to the other extreme and eventually he also fell away so now why did this see this is a it's one thing for a sanyasi uh, now even if we say that mahaprabhu's uh, instruction was for sanyasi which also prabhupad did not implement that way but why should the grahastha feel like this that you know, i have to end my life so this is a horrendous misapplication of this kind of past times that's why i started with so much broad context that literal application can lead to disaster so neither the authorities have that level of purity to demand nor should the subordinates feel guilty about this in this way so now if you look at the broader scriptural examples there are extreme examples which run both ways what do i mean by run both ways now there are not just disproportionate punishments for minor wrong actions but there are also disproportionate rewards for minor right actions we have ajamil who just chanted one name of narayan unconsciously and was relieved of all sins because of that now would we do that to criminals or wrong doers today well it's a difficult question you know so now it happened that uh, again so can we apply those scriptural principles here so there is uh, there is uh, there are devotees who are doing prison outreach and often there are many inspiring stories of how prisoners how uh, prisoners uh turn to bhakti and they they become devotees become very dedicated devotees there are amazing stories of that and there are devotees chandramouli maharaj has also written a book about uh, he is called as holy jail so holy jail means how within the jail somebody becomes pure by the practice of bhakti so one such story of um of a devotee of a person who was in a jail and how that person became devotee that came to us in back to godhead i am one of the editors for back to godhead both for the indian and international this is for the international edition and it's quite an inspiring story about how this young man who was in jail he became he became a, a devotee and then he became such a dedicated devotee was even he even started sharing krishna bhakti with others in the jail and then we were going to print it and at that time 
uh, our chief editor and then he got a letter this was this happened in south africa so he got a letter from south african uh, authorities saying that please don't publish this story and then they didn't then he forwarded the letter to us so, so what had happened was that okay this person in the jail had become a devotee but what has happened is many times in the jail stories we just is like uh, we don't talk much about why that person was in jail that person was in jail but still became a devotee so what had happened was this this young man was in jail because uh, he had molested some girl and that girl happened to be the daughter of a congregation devotee so now now he said that one one some set of devotees they said that well, he has transformed now he has transformed now he has become a wonderful devotee he is preaching so we should not consider his past at all but there is other side okay that that particular family is still a part of the community is still a part of the community of devotees and you know that if that particular family yeah, and that particular girl for that matter is going to see in back to godhead the person who is molested her portrayed as if he's such a wonderful devotee such a transformed person you know what would be the what would be the trauma they would go through so do we do we want to go through that so those who were the devotees were preaching in the jail they said you know this is you know ajamil is forgiven so many people are forgiven completely their past is wiped clean okay the past is wiped clean but it's one thing to say that okay you can practice bhakti and you become good devotee but do we want to do we want to portray that person as a extrix such a model devotee for the whole world well eventually we decided not to publish that article and uh, so in that book that in the in the book about the holy jail and other places like that the article is still available but in the scons official magazine we decided not to publish the article now is it that we don't acknowledge the potency of bhakti of course we do that we are not saying that a person's past cannot be cleansed away but there has to be context sensitivity that what is the effect is it that we lack the poor faith in the potency of bhakti is it that we lack faith in the that the devotees that the congregation devotee the family that they lack faith in the potency of bhakti no they have gone through a particular horrible horrible experience and we have to consider that so the point is scripture shows both extraordinary examples of forgiveness for now just a unconscious chanting of the holy names if you consider jagai and madai jagai and madai actually speaking what do they do they have done so many sins and they just and they have an attack like that but they mahaprabhu forgives them completely but does it end over there madai actually repents and they build the madai bridge and they try, they actively seek repentance and they try to seek repentance from all those people whom they have offended so yes at a spiritual level both the giving forgiveness for wrongs or giving punishments for wrong now they can they can happen in extraordinary ways but that doesn't mean we have we replicate them literally it has to be done with great sensitivity there was one uh, one particular spiritual master who i mean uh, so there was one disciple of his young uh, handsome good looking basically and he whatever because of his past conditionings or something he he molested this is one, one part of the world and some none of these will be shocking stories but but the i'm just illustrating the point that he he tried to molest some devotee in the congregation and then then after that the a court case went against him and things like that it became long it became quite a distasteful whole affair when he was told you cannot come to the temple and they wrote to his spiritual master and he said in the our whole tradition is tradition of forgiveness why am i not being forgiven for this i'm sorry for it so the spiritual master wrote back and told him that that as you no know, i will all i i will be your well-wisher and i'll pray for you but because of your grievous actions i can no longer accept you as my disciple 
Now, he didn't say I reject you as my disciple. He said I can no longer accept you as disciple. That means, you know, the the rules that the that you cannot come to the temple, you cannot do this. That's for the safety of the community. So how, can somebody claim, oh, the scriptural tradition is a tradition of forgiveness, so you, I should be forgiven? Well, it's not that simple. These things have to be applied carefully. So both in terms of punishment and forgiveness, how things are to be applied, that we have to be very, very careful about this. That's why literal application of the scriptures can lead, literal replication of these particular pastimes can lead to disaster. On the other hand, what may happen is somebody may deem this, oh, all this is just impractical. Now, this is just is something extreme. It doesn't has no relevance to us. But what happens is that in general in our lives, we all tend to justify and normalize our minor restriction. Justify it's no big deal. Normalize means everyone does it. And we don't we not realize that they can snowball into huge catastrophes. Like a snowball starts like a, a small snow pebble at the top. By the time it comes down, it has become a snow boulder. It can knock over a person. It can even knock around a small house. So therefore, extreme examples help in stopping us from potentially dangerous minor missteps. Those my, my missteps may be minor right now, but they can be potentially dangerous. And they can set off a chain of events. They can lead to a habit that may be overwhelming. So that's why some, uh, sometimes there are horror stories that are described. Now the horror stories may be rare possibilities, but sometimes the horror stories are highlighted to, to minimize their replication. So for example, in the past, now it is not that common, but in the past, uh, this was going to be two, three generations ago, and this happened in the West, not so much in India, but when electricity was introduced, they had like a mandatory regulation that what happens if you touch a live electric wire, that had to be depicted. Either it was through uh, audio, like somebody touches electric, uh, either a live electric wire which is open, or somebody touches a socket with uh, wet hands, how a person can get ele electrified. So whenever electricity would be installed in the house, at that time there were not so much videos were not there. But in the early days, so they would actually play out audio recordings of a person who's got a shock and is electrified and is screaming. You may say, what a, what a horrible thing to do. Nowadays, of course, uh, electric sockets and everything are much safer. Generally, even if somebody touches with wet hands, not much problems are going to come. But at that time, things were not so safe. And even now, touching uh, sockets with uh, wet hands could be dangerous. So... Now we may touch it once, nothing may happen. When we touch it a second time, nothing may happen. But who knows? Things can go wrong. So it's best to, to, in one sense, have those horror stories in mind that even this can happen. Therefore, be careful. Be careful. So the point is, we can't just dismiss them as unrealistic, impractical, extreme. Yeah, they, this example themselves may be extreme, but you need to know, the, uh, know that there is a, there is a possibility of danger and we should be cautious about it. So what is the purpose of extreme examples? The purpose of extreme examples is it is not to normalize the extreme standards. Mm -hmm. It is it is that means oh, this is what it is everybody has to do but it, it is to emphasize normal standards through extreme examples of the dangers of neglecting or flouting those standards. So you will see this difference over here. Not to normalize external standards, but to emphasize normal standards. So through extreme examples. So for example, even the Ajamil pastime, on a positive note we take. So what is the lesson from that? Does it say, oh, you can do, oh, you can do all kinds of sensual, even sinful activities till your death, but just at the time of death, chant, chant Narayana, and everything will be all right. That's never the lesson of that pastime. The lesson from the Ajamil's pastime is what? That how merciful is the holy name that Ajamil chanted once and even that too unconsciously. And by that he was delivered from Mrutipasha the Muchata. He was delivered from the uh, from the news of Yamaraj, the Yamadutas. And so the conclusion is what? If you see what 
Shukdev Goswami infers from this, and what Prabhupada explains in his purport, not his purport, what the previous acharyas also talk on their purport. So, if we do our normal sadhana, if we chant the holy names properly, then won't we be delivered? If we don't, if we do our sadhana properly, won't we be delivered? We will surely be. So that's the lesson that is drawn from there. So it's not to normalize extreme standards. Just as it's not with the positive side also, that uh, extraordinary examples of mercy. It's all same also opposite the negative side. So they are meant to emphasize normal standards through extreme examples. So what can go wrong? That's what needs to be understood. So that we don't, we minimize the possibility of giving those things, even the small chance of happening. One of my friends is in the airport security or airplane security. Uh, so they say that, you know, they, they go through a source of microscopic detail. You know, what all can go wrong when you're in an airplane and how to deal with that. How sometimes we hear that um, some planes crashing and planes crashing make a, make a, make a, make a sometimes scary news. But overall, what if you look at the statistics, actually airplane travel is much safer than road travel. In road travel, many accidents happen, but accidents are commonplace. And that's why they don't make big news, generally speaking, unless there's a major car pile with multiple accidents or there's some very significant people who die in that accident. But the point is that even every small possibility, okay, if this happens, what can we do? If this happens, what can we do? If this happens, what can we do? They try to, they try to deal with that. Why? Because we want to avoid that danger. So we could say that when we are trying to practice bhakti, it is like a spiritual air travel. Now we are, we are boarding a plane by which we are going to the spiritual world. So we want to have the best, we want to avoid dangers. So that's what it's talking about, extreme examples. So now if you want to have balanced approach, how do we go about having a balanced approach? So broadly, three things. Hmm? What did this example mean in its original context? That's the first point. What, in the original context, what is the meaning of this example? Then, what is the universal principle conveyed through this example? So, if you consider, say, this is the particular incident. Okay, this incident, what does it mean over here? Then, what is the universal principle independent of the context? Hmm? Hmm? And then that universal principle, which is up here, this is the this is the original context. This is a, uh, we could say, 16th century Bengal, uh, when this particular pastime happened. What did it mean at that time? Then what is the universal principle? And then in the 21st century, or uh, <clears throat> so now we can say, what does it mean now? What does the universal principle apply in today's context? So that's what we'll discuss one by one. So what was the meaning in original context? So at that time, Sahajiism had already started creeping into India, especially in the Bengal or area. It came through Buddhism and through Shaktism. So Buddhism, of course, is known the, uh, the teachings of Buddha. And Shaktism, mm, uh, Shaktism is actually mm, the worship of the God is Shakti. So now what had happened was Mahaprabhu wanted to protect Gaudiya Vaishnavism from this. Now Buddha himself had, had renounced the world and he was quite, uh, quite vehement about his renunciation, about emphasizing renunciation. In fact, initially he even refused to have any female followers. But only on the insistence of his disciples, he said that, uh, no, if, if if you exclude half of humanity, then how will they be delivered? So then he agreed to that. But upon depending on different commentators uh, of, of different commentators on Buddhism, some people say that it was reluctant somewhat. But anyway, he did that. However, uh, about, about a decade after Buddha departed from the world, there were some Buddhist teachers who started having dreams and they claimed to have either dreams or visions in which they said that actually what Buddha taught at that time was, was, uh, was at that time for those people because they were not very advanced. But now you are more sophisticated people, so we have advanced teaching. 
and the advanced teaching is that actually you have to go beyond the world and the world's pleasures if you want to attain enlightenment but there are different ways to do that one way is by renouncing all the world's pleasures but another way is that indulge in those pleasures and through indulging in those pleasures eventually you will you will realize their futility and you'll go beyond them so so in one sense they started teaching the opposite of what mohammed uh, what buddha was teaching and shaktism i'll explain what it was we'll discuss about sahajiism in greater detail when we talk about padmini mishra past time but shaktism in essence held that that let's see um, sahajiism was let's see what it means the general meaning of sahajiism is taking scriptural rule, rules sahaj lu it's like uh, the, those rules are meant for our purification our protection you take them chu ch- cheaply or loosely that is sahaj now the specific meaning is it is a group of pseudo religionists pseudo means false religionists who claimed that uh, divine reciprocations were happening through human sexuality that means so if there were a shiva bhakta or a shakti bhakta male and female if they would unite they would do some rituals and they would physically unite they would claim that actually it's not we who are uniting it is shiva and shakti who are uniting through us and there are some they would have their own scriptures in double quotes to justify that now this was completely rejected by the vaishnava so what happened was that this started from shaktism shiva and shakti were uniting and then it started uh, it started creeping into vaishnavism specifically in krishna bhakti why because in not so much in vishnu bhakti because there are no much description of in the intimate past times of vishnu and lakshmi there are more than aishwarya bhav but there are quite a few descriptions of the intimate past times of uh, radha and krishna in the scriptures so that was imitated and this was creeping in that time and mahaprabhu wanted to completely stamp that out nothing doing about this so he wanted to avoid any any even uh, even a remote indication that he supported anything like this that's why you know who could be a greater krishna bhakta than mahaprabhu is the the founder of gaudiya vaishnavism and when he maintained such a rigid distance that means everybody all his followers should do that unfortunately it did happen that in within one or two generations sahajiism did creep into vaishnavism gaudiya vaishnavism also but mahaprabhu wanted to mark the boundaries he wanted to protect very rigidly so we will talk about tantra a little in, a little later in the pradyumna shiva past time so in that context what was happening was mahaprabhu was very setting a very strict standard to avoid sahajiism creep into vaishnavism into gaudiya vaishnavism so that is the contextual explanation of that past time now what is the time independent principle over here time independent principle means that as i said okay in that particular context what does it mean and then universally what does it mean so male female proximity if not regulated is dangerous and it can even be disastrous uh so now this is not just something which our tradition is teaching so stories of disasters exist across history and geography and they exist even today's ultra liberal world even here in today's world when people say okay it's just it's just for the individuals to decide no no, relig- no religion no culture no tradition should be regulating it but even then there are scandals that come up and there are people who influential position sometimes they have to resign or at least they get into controversy just recently i think the one of the heads of cnn in america he was he had to resign because or he resigned because he had a relationship with one of his colleagues Now again it's only part of the story is known but basically what is known is he resigned so the point is cupid can make anyone stupid and of course not just stupid it can be scandalously stupid so that is a principle that applies all the times and 
that is a principle that is valid so now sometimes even wars have been caused because of this in the greco roman tradition there is a story which is uh, quite similar to the story of ramayana there is a story of helen of troy now helen of troy was supposed to be so troy is the kingdom helen was the princess over there uh, so it is said that helen uh, her she was so beautiful her face was so beautiful it is said about the face that set off a thousand ships that means just to win her a prince from another kingdom he launched a whole war and thousand ships went on war because of that and this is thousands of years ago thousand ships was a big time big thing at that time so the point is that people can lose all perspective and can do terrible things so that is a universal principle now how might that principle apply today so we could say that i know as i said i'll skip some things over here so caution is always needed hmm? now caution is always needed means that we may need to factor in circumstantial changes in human society that affect the specifics of gender interactions specific of gender interactions means what that how man and woman interact with each other there is some level of cultural difference and we cannot fanatically impose hmm, impose one standard on everyone hmm. in the early days i think 1966 or something like that uh oh, the several proper disciples have corroborated this past time there was this uh, quite well educated among the few well educated people who was uh, coming to the coming to prabhupada's program in 1966 and she asked used to ask very intelligent questions and then one day after a very after a very good question answer session she says swami ji i'm so inspired i'm so grateful can i give you a hug and prabhupad looked and thought what why not and now she no prabhupad didn't hug her back but she hugged prabhupad and that was that now there's no evidence that prabhupad ever after ever again after he did that and the devotees tell this past time they say that you know that prabhupad was so compassionate at that but prabhupad never did that with any of his disciples they wouldn't even think about it mm-hmm. in fact prabhupad was quite strict that even if his female disciples who were like his grand over the ages of his granddaughter he would not be alone in a room with them mm-hmm. they would come to clean his room or even offer him prasad somebody else would be there with him so in one sense at that time in new stage prabhupad felt that oh i don't want of maybe this she is expressing her affection that way let me not say no but prabhupad never made it the norm so circumstantial changes may be necessary so now what will be appropriate caution that can um, vary from situation to situation so it can be based on cultural norms so for example as a brahmachari uh, i was trained in the early days that when you talk with women you don't look at their eyes look away and talk so okay and what what is the reason that's considered disrespectful now when i started going abroad one of my senior god brothers is a brahmachari he told me that when he had first time gone abroad and he had avoided eye contact with women and actually many of the especially western women they had complained to our spiritual master that he treats us so impersonally he treats us so impersonally now the whole point is how is respect shown how respect feelings are to be there so even in india today if we go to some traditional village some more, more tra- uh, traditional place you know quite often in the women if they are talking with a uh, uh, man who is not their husband they will themselves have their uh, they have their ungat or some cloth around their head and even they themselves will not look at them and then actually for the man to look at them and try to have eye contact with them would be inappropriate so at that time if a man in son having eye contact that woman will feel disrespected but in today's world if a man does not have eye contact while talking he says who do you think I... so what may happen is 
say so professional standards is in today's world when we are interacting with people if there are some colleagues then some uh, they may expect to shake hands and may be expected even from somebody who is in the announced order and it's considered disrespectful if you don't do it now in some cause some say some situations we may just say that in our tradition we fold hands and they mix it in some tradition may not so these are we may have to be appropriately cautious so you know desire is often not indiscriminate that means for some people desire may uh may be triggered or the mind may become agitated so a particular kind of interaction may be okay for one person but another person finds it's very agitating the personal vulnerability may also be required to be factored in so how exactly one keeps that distance the forms may vary but the principles remain so that principle we need to follow and we need to apply it in a way that helps everyone to move uh, to safely practice bhakti so that's the broad application and one one point i'll quickly conclude with that did Mah- was mahaprabhu actually harsh and did he really reject chota haridas yeah we could say that uh, he was he as i said he refused to see chota haridas he refused to even listen to elderly vaishnav ek parman puri so we could say he was rejected him but no he actually didn't stop his associates from consoling and helping chota haridas and these associates who are they they are also pure devotees they are also exalted devotees so through his devotees mahaprabhu exhibited compassion towards him his devotees is pure devotee associates wouldn't do anything that would displease him so as the acharya he set the standard that this is what you should be doing uh, that he, this is what he would do but that does not mean that he wanted others to do the same th- others to do the same thing there's compassion over there then in so he personally kind of chota haridas he was acharya and that's what he did but he also comforted haridas thakur through his associates to set an example of vaishnava compassion even for those who were deemed who may have been who may be deemed fallen so this is subtle so this is you no know, i i was in one community where the i knew one devotee quite well and then he ran into some problems and some things happened and he 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 was banned from that community he did something which was highly inappropriate so then when i was visiting that place uh i asked my spiritual master you know i mean his case was well known that he said that uh, that uh, now what should i do How, uh, should i meet him should i not meet him he, he, i would spend a good amount of time whenever i'd meet him so he said that you know our relationships cannot be dictated now I, i'm paraphrasing and this is what some other senior prabhupada said also told me he says you know our relations your relationship of friendship should not be based solely on what as a institution we needed to do to protect the broader community so he says that yes on one side we want to protect the community so what he did there has to be some consequences for that but on other side we want to also we don't want to reject him we also want him to practice bhakti so he says that don't meet him in the temple if there are some devotees who who are sympathetic towards him who understand or who are more understanding maybe in that devotee's house you can invite him and you can talk with him so the point was that it is as a standard some action may have to be taken but we have human relationships we have personal relationship which is a spiritual component and just because somebody has done something wrong even if it is terribly wrong that doesn't mean that it's like all friendships all relationships 1 to 0 and that person generally when somebody comes to bhakti often they give up everything from the world and come to bhakti and if the whole devotee community gives them up that would be horrible even if there's something wrong we need to maintain some relationship with them bhakti charu maharaj once when i had met him he told he mentioned to me that one of his projects was that many of shri prabhupada's disciples left the movement after prabhupada departed uh, because of various reasons so he said now they are trying to they have, they have the database locate all those disciples and invite them to come and stay in mayapur and he said our hope is we will give them 
free staying and free uh, prasad and they can spend the last days of their life in mayapur so now the other devotees are also working on that so many of them had some problems they fell away in some sense but there has to be compassion also and another point is that mahaprabhu is not unforgiving so he committed suicide normally if somebody commits suicide that person just becomes a ghost now did chhota hari exactly become a ghost well ghosts don't sing the holy names usually uh, ghost singing won't give pleasure to mahaprabhu he was not a miserable and misery causing ghost he got an elevated body in which he continued his devotion he still had the devotion that desire to glorify mahaprabhu and he couldn't come in his physical body in the presence of mahaprabhu and sing for mahaprabhu's pleasure but in his ethereal body he did fulfill that desire so it is uh, it is just like the demons who sometimes killed by krishna are also delivered by him so mahaprabhu strict standards may have led to the ending of the body of chhota haridas but that in no way destroyed his devotional desire in fact the devotional desire was fulfilled and he was he was appropriately elevated so there are many nuances in this past time and overall what we learn is that we all need to be cautious but we don't have to be extremists so i'll summarize and then we'll have some questions if, if there are any so i mentioned primarily four points in today's class the first point was i discussed about the antilira and how we are going to cover it and chota haridas past time we we don't have much detail about that past time because in the medieval times indian culture was a face saving culture so the extent of the wrong what it was apart from the gans what it was it's very difficult for us to know then second point was that the was it extreme punishment well yes and no it was extreme but the extreme is not meant to be made the norm so we discussed about the pendulum and in the pendulum if we make it literal replication it could be a disaster we just dismiss it as um, as impractical and that could also lead to uh, danger inviting laxity therefore we need to have a balance and how do we have the balance by considering three questions okay what does this mean in the original context it meant that mahaprabhu was taking a strong stand to protect gaudiya vaishnavism from sahajiism it's one understanding and what is the universal principle that there is always danger in male female interactions and what is the contemporary application of that we have to have appropriate caution when we deal now what is the appropriate caution that may vary according to cultural professional and personal contexts and the last point was was mahaprabhu unforgiving no he himself might have been unforgiving but that same mahaprabhu acted in a different way uh, through his associates to show compassion and chota haridas was not uh, he didn't become simply a ghost who was punished for ending his life but rather in a ethereal body his his mahaprabhu accepted his accommodated his desire to serve by, uh, and to sing for his pleasure through that ethereal body so that this is a nuanced past time and we need a nuanced understanding to draw some lessons and apply from it thank you very much hari krishna are there any questions i know we didn't have time for reflections today from the previous session but uh, i wanted to focus on this past time are there any questions or comments okay there is yes sundar hari prabhu Uh, thank you very much for uh, your class gave a very nice uh, clarification on this past time we were we were we were taking this past time to an extreme level but you like explain that how this extreme level is to to teach us to avoid the minor steps also and dangers also thank you very much for the clarification bro bro mm-hmm. sometime in office we like we have to interact with the opposite sex you know and uh, sometime like they are young beautiful also and uh, you know there is a long long matlab oh, there is a lot of passage of time like 3 months 4 months we interact with them uh, for our office work there are not be initially there may not be uh, like agitation but over a period of time it becomes like uh, agitation so like how to handle like all such incidents in the office like yeah it's tough 
see what happens is that uh, what makes us tougher is that sometimes uh, you know what is considered uh, what they consider as appropriate behavior is what we may consider as inappropriate they may dress in a particular way conduct themselves in a particular way and um, there might be some kind of uh, generally it is not there but there might be some kind of flirting also people just behave in a sometimes in a non, in a way that may not be appropriate so it's it's a complex world you know in the in communist countries when uh, and they both in europe and china not in ussr and china they had a rule that uh, there would the men and women would everybody when they would come to the factories or offices everybody would wear uniforms and no makeup was allowed and uh, it was you are here simply as workers so that was one but that's more or less considered extreme in today's world and now in the west uh, in the west uh, there are uh, rules especially that some places say that you know we don't encourage workplace relationships and we want we also as a professional you want to focus on work and they have their dress codes and things like that but sometimes that's considered an intrusion on on people's individual rights how can anybody impose a dress code so it's a it's it's a complex world now the problem with that is also imposing like strict dress codes is that the work culture is becoming the work load is often becoming very demanding and generally at least in the western world what people have found is that almost 70% of the people who get married now again this is 70s it's in america so it may not be the same everywhere 70% of the people who get married they find their partners in the workplace because most people just they're so busy with their work and their life that they have very little time otherwise to explore a relationship to develop a relationship now arranged marriages as a concept is not there in the western world at all so there is some protest against avoiding that kind of relationships also so for people the workplace also becomes a place for exploring relationships so so overall the point is that how the genders are to interact with each other so there have to be some rules governing it so even in ultra liberal times so like one of the things is consent consent is absolutely important without which you cannot have interactions that's that's understood so currently the indian government is even or the indian in, in indian courts there is this whole uh, case come up where even a husband cannot have a, a relationship a physical relationship with a woman with his wife without her consent and that if that is done even that could be called as physical violation and that could be legally culpable but that can open a whole pandora's box because how do we actually define that it's complex so my point is that we live in a very in a historically unprecedented time that in general but what we talk as you know western it's not even western because even in the west uh, about 100 years ago the interactions between genders were quite regulated they're quite regulated in fact there is a britain by a britisher who came to india this is about uh, what is the time this maybe 1820 uh, 1880 or 1890 that time so he wrote that there is a written book and they had come to bengal and this is a britisher and he's writing you know these bengali women have no sense of decency and when they come out in public they don't cover their ankles so ankles they said that their idea that now their idea is that if a woman is showing her legs and ankles that indicate that she has no sense of decency now that is a, a clearly imposing a british standard on india because britain is a cold country and everybody covers their feet people wear socks now in india if everybody starts wearing socks it's expensive it's a hot country you get sweat it's just not practical so nobody wears but the point was they were considered bengali women loose because they were not covering their ankles when they're coming in public so we can't call this western culture this is just we could say modern or post modern culture where there are free interactions or not actually free there are nobody knows what the rules are so generally the best way is that 
we try to have a professional demeanor so that we don't you know we can be we can be polite but you know let's not prolong any interactions more than necessary be professional and people also understand that more or less and uh, you have to pray to krishna and minimize things so generally speaking if we have something to fill our mind with mm-hmm. that means something spiritual something which absorbs us and when the mind starts getting agitated we turn toward that and we fill our mind with that then it's easier so it's uh, we don't have to be too hard on ourselves because it's a tough time and uh, krishna is an understanding god so so that's those my three points i would say that no one knows how to regulate that in today's world because it's just a historically unprecedented at times and we don't have to be too hard with ourselves but try to have something to fill krishna fill our minds with krishna and um, try to have uh, try to keep the interactions um, professional and polite okay yeah replace lower pleasure with higher pleasure deepika mata ji mentioning yes thank you bro just like, uh, like can i ask something bro yeah is there any question by anyone else before we finish you can have another question now. okay okay yes subudhi we'll come back to you sundari prabhu right yes subudhi madha prabhu yeah prabhu hari krishna dandu pranam prabhu ji <clears throat> so uh, after listening the ajamila's past time prabhu ji means uh, one may question that uh, if it is simply to uh, glorify the holy name that what power what power or what potency the ho- one name of the lord narayan is then one may think so what is there for me to take out of this what is the what is the lesson for me to take out of this so is it that uh, apart from glorification of the holy name there is a warning signal that even though you are uh, practicing brahmana if you are exposing yourself to obscenity you may fall down or there is some higher principle apart from this of course that that is a very much a lesson the hayato vishan pamsa is probably illustrated in the most you could say uh, scary way in that particular past time so that is also lesson. multiple lessons can be there i was focusing more on the redemptive aspect mm. uh, there is that that one can be purified and transformed that aspect is very much there uh, so that's where we can uh, we can stop over there but uh, there could be different lessons from different aspects of the past time so but the specific forgiveness aspect is not meant to be a license that everybody can go around and do the same thing and nothing will happen hmm? okay okay last question so uh, we have sundar ji you had one more question we'll stop with that Yes, bro. I asked you to unmute. Okay. Uh, bro, like uh, we, when we hear this past time, uh, Chetanam Mahaprabhu is setting up setting a nice uh, like uh, high standard, and uh, you know, uh, bro, like uh, at least I don't have any standard in this. Like, so like uh, in in my own situation, uh, what is expected from me? Like, what is like expected from me? Like, how should I understand these things, bro? yeah it's we all are at a particular level in our spiritual journey in our particular uh, we could say challenges in this domain so we just try one step forward from where we are okay this is where where i am at i don't at least i don't want to go down from here i don't take one step forward so that's how it works mm. the in one sense in spiritual life there are the stars and there are the stairs the stars are high high up and the stairs are they show one step forward one step for one step forward the wonderful thing is that if you just keep taking this one steps forward you may say this star is these steps how are they going to take the stars but actually krishna has the potency that if he just sees that we are taking the steps up consistently tesham ham samuddharta he will raise us up to the stars that will happen by his mercy so we have, we need to just leave that part to him they say from the the journey from the stars to the stairs uh, how it will happen we don't know but we just keep taking the steps what we can from our level uh, the stars and eventually 
he will lift up he will bridge the gap between the staircase and the stars eventually okay bro bro is it like that unless and until i am free from this desire i will not go back come back to god it is it like that i don't know to like <laughs> well frankly I, i mean i just wouldn't like to make a comment about going back to godhead the prabhupad has made multiple statements sometimes he said that even if you have one desire to eat a gulab jamun you won't go back to godhead but prabhupad also said that no you just hold on to my dhoti i'll take you to back to godhead just follow the rules of bhakti and you will what he has given he will take us back to godhead now there are case, but there are cases of some of prabhupad's disciples who actually gave up the practice of bhakti for some time but their end was very glorious many of them seem to have some vision of prabhupad prabhupad you came to me you came for me prabhupad they say so even when somebody didn't follow uh, even the fundamental rules of bhakti even they seem to have been elevated so i don't think we need to at this stage worry so much about about uh, that aspect so much See, in general focus on trying to strengthen our desire to serve krishna so if we can at the very least make our desire for krishna stronger than our desire for everything else that itself will show krishna that we want to come to him and eventually he will we will get there okay thank you thank you very much which shloka deepika mataji you mentioning which which shloka am i talking about dhyayato vishayan pumsa that's 261 that's 262 63 in the bhagavad gita 2.6263 that's what the ajamil past time refers to okay thank you very much shri chaitanya charita amrit ki jai shila prabhu pad ki jai gaur bhakta vrind ki jai itai gaur premanandi